Hello and welcome to our program, 10 Lessons Learned, where we talk to business people, journalists, professors, ambassadors, leaders and luminaries from all over the world. My name is Siebe van der Zee and I'm your host. I'm originally from the Netherlands, happily residing in the beautiful Grand Canyon state of Arizona in the United States. I'm also known as the Dutchman in the desert. I want to thank our affiliate partner, Audible. Audible is an amazing way to experience 10 lessons learned, but also books and other podcasts, allowing you to build a library of knowledge all in one place. You can start your free 30-day trial by going to audibletrial.com slash 10 lessons learned. Again, that is audibletrial.com 10 lessons learned, all lowercase, to get your free 30-day trial. Our guest today is Alberto Esparza. Uh, Alberto has served as the founder and president of the Cisa Poeta Foundation for 28 years. The mission of the Cisa Poeta Foundation, it stands for Yes You Can, is to provide opportunities for underserved young people and to develop an interest and proficiency in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Alberto, quote unquote, retired last year to start his latest nonprofit, the iRISE Foundation, dedicated to provide underserved and underrepresented students an opportunity to consider STEM as a career choice. Again, very valuable. You can learn more about Alberto Esparza on our website, 10lessonslearned.com. Buenos dias, Alberto. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Tibet. It's a pleasure to be on your platform and I look forward to the dialogue. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I am so curious in, in the work that you have done and I see a beautiful picture behind you of it looks like young girls playing soccer. What is your, your interest and, and commitment to doing this, helping young people in underserved communities for now 30 years? Where is that coming from? Uh, that's basically coming from where I grew up. I grew up in a impoverished area, a lot of gang activity and gang violence, but I had a beautiful grandmother who raised me very well, always taught me from right from wrong and wanted me to serve others because I saw how she served others. She was about like 95 years old before she passed. And I recall her going into the neighborhoods and making sure that, you know, the homeless had something to eat. And I saw that on a daily basis. And we went to church every day. Seven days a week, we would walk two miles <laughs> from her home to church on a regular basis. So she was my role model and she meant the world to me. So she taught me well. Wonderful, wonderful. The iRISE Foundation, please explain the purpose and again, the work that the foundation is doing. Okay, a couple of years ago, I had prostate cancer. So I was very ill and that led to my decision to retire from CISA Puerto Foundation. When the doctor gave me the green light to go ahead and go back into the community, I really wasn't going to go back into the community. It was the community that was calling me up. They wanted me to go back and deliver soccer and deliver all the programs that I used to deliver. And uh, it was a very easy decision because I was at home, not doing anything, crying, lonely. And I said, you know what? I really got to get back to the community because I needed the community more than the community needed me. So I started iRISE, but I wanted to do something very unique. I wanted to focus on the Native American students. And so in the past, I worked with uh, Skyline Gila River, St. Peter Indian Mission School, the Boys and Clo uh, Club in the Sacaton, which are predominantly Native American. And it was the best decision I made. So I'm currently delivering those programs, but I'm still in Chandler. I'm in Chandler because I have a wonderful school district the Chandler Unified School District. Without them, I'm a nonprofit in search of the Chandler Unified School District. So they have been really good to me these past years. So I want to continue to serve the Latino community, but also expand my services to the Native American communities. Very powerful indeed, and helping young people by giving them opportunities and access to opportunities and doing it in a way that they enjoy. Right? Because again, if I think about the activities that you organize, it's fun, it's enjoyable. And of course, these young people, they benefit from it. Uh, that, must, that must make you feel good doing that for 30 years and living that life. 
you know, throughout the presentation, you're going to hear me discuss relationship building. And one of the things that I did is the first lesson that we're going to talk about is relationship building. I never assumed uh, what the community wanted. I always built in, no matter what program, stakeholders. I built these committees to let the community explain to me what they wanted. So a lot of the programs that I have are um, really as a result of what the community needs. The soccer program is really, really growing. I think this year we're going to have close to 600 kids involved in our program. It runs from September, it goes all the way through May. The beauty of this program is run by the parents and is run by our high school students. And we have no money. But when you go out there to those fields, everybody has a uniform. We got referees. Our parents are background check. It runs pretty smooth. A lot of people ask me, well, how do you do it? It's pretty easy. It's because I'm engaged in the community. The community has told me what programs they wanted. And that's the reason why I've been successful. Before that, I used to assume what the community wanted, and that was a big mistake. So these programs are offered um, based on what the community needs are. Fascinating. And at the same time, I recognize that you have to already move to lesson number one. Yes, Don't sir. assume you know how to engage the community. That is our lesson number one today. But I want to go one step back, if you don't mind. Sure. Because I know you talk about the work that you're doing, and that's what we want to hear, and the wisdom that you have learned from that. But just, let's say, to start out, what kind of lesson would you like to teach yourself if you would be 30 years old today? What have you learned that you would like to have learned a few years ago? Well, when I first got into the nonprofit organizations, I didn't really know what the nonprofit was. I didn't know what you know, a strategic planning was, I didn't know board development. I didn't know, even know how to write a grant. So I took the bull by the horns and started a nonprofit without really knowing. I was pretty good in the community, but I was pretty bad in terms of the business aspect of it. So if I could tell a young Alberto, the 30 years ago is to take some classes on nonprofit. I believe at the time they were offering that at Arizona State University. I looked into it, but I never followed up. So a lot of the experience I gained was because of failures. But if I can go back, I would sit down with a um, young Alberto and basically said, hey, if you're going to start this nonprofit, it's going to be a difficult journey. My suggestion to you would take a couple of classes, learn everything that you can, learn about grant writing, which really killed me. I didn't have a clue. My first grant was written in pencil, <laughs> it was written in pencil. And I recall that I submitted it to the Valley of the Sun, United Way. And um, basically, it was a difficult the conversation between the Valley of United Way and myself. But uh, it was a horrible grant. And I knew that I was not going to get it. But I would sit down with Alberto and say, you know what? You're going to create this nonprofit. Uh, you have all the experience in the community. But my suggestion would be take a couple of classes, take a deep breath ask a lot of questions, go visit other nonprofits, other CEOs, know what you're getting into. And that's what I would tell Alberto Sparza. Know what you're getting into. I like it. Good point. So we talked about lesson number one, don't assume you know how to engage a community. Lesson number two, don't be afraid to fail. Throughout my journey, I had failed big time. And it is a direct result that I didn't have any experience in the nonprofit world. Mm -hmm. I had an idea that I wanted to serve the community. Great idea. You have to understand that a lot of nonprofits are started by somebody in the community who really doesn't have that business sense. But yeah. one of the things that I learned and a teacher, uh, when I was in the sixth grade, she taught me how to goal set and she taught me how to set goals, minimum goals, medium and goals and long-term goals. And I remember that. So when I started the foundation, I started to set those type of goals. But my teacher reminded me that I was not going to accomplish all the goals that I set. Nobody does. What was important is going after them. And it wasn't the material things that was important, but your journey in pursuit of your goals. And she said, because you're goal setting, it's going to make you a better professional. But more importantly, a better human being. 
Goals keep you focused. They give you a sense of purpose. And I truly believe, I tell young people because they all want to start nonprofits. And I said, learn how to set goals. That's going to be very important. And that's what I've done throughout my career was set the small goals that are going to give me immediate success and then build upon that. And um, I think I've become an expert in goal setting. Now, when it comes to failure, yes, don't give up, keep going. But let's face it, the reality of failure can be very, very tough, right? We can think of, of several situations, but it could be on the financial side. Uh, yeah, keep going. Wait a minute. I don't have any money. So how do you teach? Easy question, hard answer. But how do you teach someone to overcome failure? How do you motivate them to say, do it again, keep going? Many of these nonprofits are started by somebody in the community that doesn't have the business sense, but what separates them from others is their passion and their motivation. And that helps you throughout your journey. When I didn't have any funding, you know, there was one period and I'm gonna talk about that. Um, I believe in the mid nineties, I was sleeping in a vacant office. I didn't have a vehicle. I was walking from school district to school district to deliver my programs. And I could have easily quit. As a matter of fact, I woke up that early morning wanting to quit and get away from nonprofit because I felt alone. But what kept me going was my motivation to serve the community and my motivation to never give up, no matter how difficult it was. And, and I remind people, this is your journey. Nobody cares about your journey, but you. So you have to make a decision. If there's something that you want, then you got to be able to overcome those obstacles and you got to keep, keep at it. Eventually you'll have success. And that's been my philosophy. You, you mentioned the passion. It's important perhaps as a mentor to have the passion to guide individuals and then the individuals, each individual by him or herself, they have to light that fire and say, yes, I can do that. They have to feel right. And you have to, in a way, help them get to that point. You know, one thing that I like to mention is that years into the foundation of my struggle, I was adopted by a group of social venture partners, Arizona. They're a nonprofit organization in Arizona. And I think they're nationally known that adopts five nonprofits per year. And um, they reached out to me. How they found me, did they? I have no idea, but they <laughs> found me. And uh, they met with me. They took me to dinner. And they wanted me to come in to the organization so that they can give me the tools to be successful. And I don't want to forget them because they were very instrumental in my success. They gave me board training. They helped me with my grants. They were able to get me a CPA. So um, I believe that occurred in 1998. Without them, I would not have had the success. So uh, when you're doing good, people will take notice. I was doing good and people were noticing because I was getting a lot of calls for folks who wanted to come into the organization and see how I was doing this. Back in 1998, I really didn't know if I wanted to continue to be a nonprofit, but when Social Venture Partners Arizona brought me in and I'm asking everybody to look them up because they've been phenomenal to me. So they provided the expertise that I needed to go forward. Yeah. Well, let's go to lesson number three. Leadership is defined by the community. And I'm kind of curious, you're going to explain it, no doubt. What do you mean with the community? Well, I'm focusing on the Latino community because that's all I've known throughout my career. The Latino community is very fickle. They are very careful on whom they're going to bestow the term leadership. A lot of these folks come from Mexico or other Spanish speaking countries. And there's a lot of fraud within the political systems where they're at. So they see leaders in a different light when they come to America. So leadership is relationship building. And I am an expert in relationship building. And I'm a leader that have walked beside the community as opposed to have led from above. I have supported the community uh, when there's been in social injustices. So I have marched alongside them for hundreds of miles. And 
I think the community, when they see that and they see how you respond to communities, a few years back, I had a call and this is going to define where my leadership comes from. I had a call from a parent at 2 a.m. in the morning. And you know, Sebe, every time you get a call at 2 a.m. in the morning, you know something has happened that is not good. Yeah. And on the other line was a parent crying profusely. She had told me that one of, that one of her sons was gunned down by a drive-by shooting. Hmm. I listened to her for about five minutes as she was in tears. And after she stopped crying, I told her, give me your address. I'll be over there within a half hour to an hour. When I went there, I told the parents that I would help them with the funeral expenses. Right away, I got the community engagement. I said, this, this was the only child of these two parents and the community really supported these efforts. We were able to do that. And not only that, is that I was able to provide food uh, because I know that they had a lot of people who were coming in from different countries to come in and to pay their respects. So that's what it is. When the community sees that you're willing to go above and beyond, it's that's when you got the community. I know other leaders that really don't do that engagement. As a matter of fact, the NAACP about 15 years ago, when they had their annual dinner, they talked about returning to the community that they have left the community. I have never left the community. I teach English as a second language. I, I, I'm in there in the soccer. I'm there on the dance programs. I was there for the scholars. I was there at wedding, funerals. And that's where your leadership comes up. How engaged are you? Uh, relationship building. They'll never forget that. And today I'm very lucky that I have the community to support. Um, I don't have to distribute flyers for my program. They know where I am. They go on Facebook. Um, these programs are great because I have an opportunity to meet parents and children in the morning and the afternoon after every game, after every program. And we talk about, you know, what issues they're having and what problems that I can solve. I have a question. I have a question. The way you deal with Native American communities, of course, they are different than Latino communities. Building relationships with young people and their parents and their leaders. How would you describe that? Initially, it wasn't too positive. There was a lot of history between the Native American and the United States. One of the things that they haven't forgotten is how they've been treated during the Trail of Tears when President Jackson forced the Native Americans to walk miles and miles and miles, hundreds of miles. A lot of the Native Americans died during their journey. It's very difficult, but I have been in the Native American community for five years. They have seen me provide these services. I'm able to talk to them. Uh, we hosted an underwater uh, of the competition in May, 2022, and we invited the Native American communities. And I was so happy that a lot of parents came in, a lot of kids, they participated. I provided food, I listened to them, I talked to them, I shook their hands. That's relationship building. You've got to be able to do that. I see other CEOs who don't do that. I appreciate you, you bring this up because it's something that sometimes is, can we say, overlooked, underestimated. Exactly. But is it, it is of extreme value to show the respect for Native American cultures. And in the work that you do, you experience that. And, and I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, so thank you for that. I want to move on to lesson number four. You have already touched on some of that. Lesson number four, set goals. Well, my question would be, how do you measure, do you measure goals? It's one thing to set them, but at some point you say, did we meet the goals or not? Is that something that you include? Yeah, it's very basic. It's not rocket science. I set goals. Maybe I'm going to develop a new program that the, that the community is asking for. And I'm engaged throughout their process from the beginning of the dialogue to when the programs are delivered until the end. I ask a lot of questions. I ask the community, are we meeting your need? What can we do differently? And again, that goes back to relationship building and engagement. The community 
wants their leaders to be engaged with them, to not be afraid to talk to them. So I measure success based on the number of students or the number of participants who are involved in our programs. And I measure the success because I do a free and post test. Yeah. I want to get an idea of how they feel about this class. And at the end, what they felt that we can do better or what they did like. They like that. And these committees that I have created give them an opportunity and they love it because I really believe that they like to tell me <laughs> what they like. And I take on that role. I never get offended by that because I know who I'm working with. And I know that's imperative that I do that to develop these relationships. It creates a, a level of ownership, right? When they are asked to give their opinions and people are included, they feel they are part of it and they are part of it. Yes. And I have to make a quick comment because I know I'm speaking a lot, but Dr. King said this, and he said, if you build a community and you fail to include a certain segment of that community, those who feel excluded will unconsciously destroy everything that you build. And I remember that quote, and I tried to follow what Dr. King was doing during the sixties. He was great at it, getting the community engagement. He was out there. So getting them involved and making them become stakeholders is very important. So when we have strategic planning, we invite the community as well to give their input. Yeah. Inclusive. I, I like it very much. Lesson number five, be willing to learn lessons from others. H have you had a mentor in your life or did you really have to figure it out yourself? One of the big mistakes that I made is that I thought I knew everything going into it. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was a big mistake. I mean, I had graduated with a master's degree in education. I had sat on um, one of the largest boards in the state of Arizona, maybe in the country. A Chicanos por la causa, and I, oh, sure. I would be able to emulate that. But I was, I was always willing to learn. When I started to fail here and there, I began to open myself and make myself available to learn. I reached out to other CEOs. Uh, again, Social Venture Partners of Arizona really helped me tremendously. They brought me in. Um, they taught me so much that I had gained, gained a lot of knowledge, and that basically helped me out, and I was able to move forward. Sure, sure. We're talking today with Alberto Esparza, a very successful servant leader, providing educational opportunities for young people in underserved communities, sharing his 10 lessons learned. We're moving up. Lesson number six. You have been so positive in everything you said, and here you say, embrace negativity, embrace negativity. Curious what you mean with that. Okay. Throughout my journey, I had a lot of naysayers. I never call them haters. Young people today would call them haters. I said, that's a little bit too strong. So I had naysayers. I had a speech impediment going in and I started profusely. I had to go get some classes because I realized that as a CEO, you need to be able to articulate your message. So I was able to do that. But a lot of people, they pointed at me and said that I was not going to be successful. Even family members, say, they would tell me, I don't think you're going to be able to do it. You don't have the business background, uh, you're going to fold. And what I tell young people today is embrace negativity. Use that as a source of motivation and inspiration. Someone's opinion of you is not your reality. And that's what I have maintained throughout my career. You know, it was very difficult at the beginning, but you just got to keep going forward. If this is your passion, this is what you want to do throughout your career, then you got to be able to embrace it. Let it go. Don't think about it. Just use that as motivation and inspiration. This is what I teach the young people today is someone's opinion of you is not your reality. Those people who point at you and say, you're not going to do this. They're going to be silenced beginning today. You mentioned passion before, and I can see that that is a, a key driving force in who you are dealing with adversity, helping people that are dealing with adversity. I'm curious, is there a role model? And you mentioned Dr. King, but I think also earlier you referred to your grandmother and to have someone that perhaps reminds you from time to time, even though you have to do it, who would you, perhaps if I can ask you, who would you pick as, as that particular person? Growing up, it was my grandma. 
she adopted me. Uh, she raised me from a infant uh, until her passing when I was, I believe, age 22. Uh, very humble grandma, always doing things in the community. I would see her in the kitchen, Sebe, making a pot of beans, making burritos, making red chili, and making sure that the homeless near where we live, she was out there providing food. And she used to do that on a tray. I mean, these homeless people were getting um, their food served on a tray, glass, making sure that she come back with dessert. She was very inspirational. So when I was a 12 years old, I tried to raise money in my community. I did a carnival <laughs> and we had a lot of games uh, and I was raising money for the homeless and um, we had quite a bit of kids come out there. And so I started to learn uh, where I really learned was when I got into the community college and I joined a club called Mecha. And that's where I learned social activism. They were very active during that time. And as a young lad, I'm, I mean, I read all, everything that you can possibly read about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I still know all his speeches today. So, but I think it started with my grandma. She was a great role model to me. We didn't have a lot, but man, I loved her. Even I, I mean, I think about her every time I see homeless and what she would do to help out the homeless in her community. So she was my role model for sure. Yeah, important. And I appreciate you share that. Lesson number seven, seek out a higher power. I think I know what you're talking about, but please explain. In the, in the late 1990s, I had exhausted all my savings. I was flat broke. I didn't have a vehicle. I was picking up some bottles and cans just to kind of uh, buy lunch. And uh, a person in the community allowed me to use their office. I didn't have any windows and uh, it was vacant. And I recall sometime in November, it was pretty, pretty cold, cold. And I was sleeping on the floor, true story. And I woke up about three o'clock and I wasn't, I was ready to quit. Uh, I was angry at God. I didn't want to talk to God anymore. I didn't want to pray because I felt that he let me down, that I was doing his will, but I didn't see any intervention from his end. That night I had a dream because I was reading a poetry about God and how God was always behind folks when they didn't realize that he wasn't there. And I had a dream that he, he told me that you were never alone. I was always there. So that got to me. And, um, but I was really angry. I mean, I was all alone from 1993 to 1998. I exhausted, I don't know, close to a hundred thousand dollars that I would never get back. And, um, I felt that I was a failure at that time and time goes so quick. Seven. And so, but then I realized that you know, he was behind me throughout this period and I apologized to him and we had a chat and I told him that I was ready to go and continue to do his work. But that was one of the most difficult periods of my life is having no friends. Uh, there's nobody to talk to when you're all alone and you don't have any money. And, uh, but I'm grateful that the community knew who I was and made sure that I had some burritos or this and that. And when you have no car, you're pretty much stuck where you're at. And I never shared that with anybody. This is the first time that I'm sharing this on the broadcast. Wow. Well, I, I think it's, it's inspirational for many people, people that are going through rough times. And there are, as we both know, many people all over the world that deal with that. But I'm also thinking again of younger people that uh, go through tough stages, also in their minds, they're dealing with adversity or sometimes opportunities and how to find the guidance wherever that comes from and it could be a family member it could be someone's uh, religion but we all need that kind of assistance and that's what you're talking about um, seek out a higher power lesson number eight it's never personal and my comment would be really <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question as i got older i learned that it's not personal uh, when I was younger, everything was personal. I took it to heart. I was always angry. But then it comes to the time where you grow up and you said, if you take things personal, you're never going to get things done. You harbor these ill feelings against folks. 
I made a commitment that I was going to insulate myself from everybody who was negative or criticize others. And I told, I tell people today is that be careful what you say, what you do, how you speak and what you write, because social media today will catch up to you. Absolutely. I made that a promise that I was just going to not worry about that and try my best not to be critical because if I'm critical for others, they're going to come back and find my faults. And I never wanted that to happen. Now I'm with you when you say, don't take it personal. That's very important. On the other hand, are you also advising someone not to consider it personal? I'm thinking of someone that, you know, for example, in traffic gets so upset with me for what I did in traffic. And we both know they can be quite expressive. Don't you take it personal? No, I keep driving at the same time. Maybe it was meant personal. <laughs> no, that's a good comment because I don't even take in personal in those situations because I never know what the other person has in his vehicle. I'm always in, <laughs> in today's world and today's news. You see a lot of bad things that can happen when you take, oh, it, yeah. when you get off of your car and you confront someone. I let things go and just move forward. But again, you're talking about a more older person, a more mature that's been through the, the ringer at an early age when I decided that I was not going to be consumed by that, that I was just going to move forward. But I've been in some tough situations where I decided, well, I'm just going to leave this situation and move on and not think about it. Uh, it's really easy because I'm more mature and I've been through a lot earlier and I don't want to continue to harbor on that anymore. It's a great point, and that's exactly what we want to share with people. Not that we expect that a lot of people that are aggressive are currently listening to our conversation, mm -hmm. but it is a good reminder that we shouldn't take things personal and, you know, take some, some space and some time sometimes before responding to whatever it may be, including social media or politics, anywhere in the world, right? It's quite negative and uh, we have to find a way to create a balance and live with it. But um, it goes into lesson number nine, Alberto. Lesson number nine, we live in a glass house. Where do you take that conversation? What is that all about? Well, that goes back to social media. That goes back to mm. negative thinking. That goes back to, to criticizing others because you know, if you believe you have no faults, people are quick to find faults and they'll post that no matter where. But I tell these young people, especially these young people who are on the social media and they say what they want to say and they don't realize that that's going to come back to, to hunt them. I deal with a lot of young engineers and I tell them as that you better best believe that your potential employers are looking at whatever you post. And I tell them constantly. Whatever you post, no matter what your email address is, be very careful. Cause I've seen some email addresses that are very risque and these are potential engineers. So I have to sit down and said, you know what? You live in a glass house and people are always looking in there and they're always trying to fall full. And that, and that is going to cost you whether or not a career or that is going to cost you something, your family. And so I think that we have to learn that is that we do live in a glass house and being a community leader. You know, I'm always mindful of that. I'm always mindful or where I go, who I talk to. And again, I never post anything negative to hurt others. Even if I don't agree, I do call people up. We can agree to disagree, but I like talking to people and people who know me know exactly what I mean is that I would always call them up, but uh, just be careful what you do. It's going to be not like it cannot be emphasized enough, I think, because obviously with digital media, they learn about their users very quickly. We all know this when we go to certain uh, platforms with social media. And I think I, I agree with you posting negative things that follows you, you know, for as long as it's out there and it's not necessarily helpful. Of course, in some cases, people 
live off the attention for commercial reasons, so-called influencers who are, you know, every day selling products and making tons of money, they need to be visible. So it, it's something that we have to be aware of and the negative impact. And, and I see that as a business recruiter, attracting talent, there is so much information out there from many people. And we just have to be aware every day that that is the case. And it is a glass house. It is a glass house. And it also goes to drift. And I tell these young ladies, I said, you got to be very careful what you post. That's going to stay there for a long time. And if you're trying to get a professional job, rest assured, uh, these employers are looking at all your social media. Very important. Mm -hmm. Lesson number 10, lesson number 10, Alberto, here we are. Be careful what you ask for. And that goes back to my early days when I was first starting the foundation. You know, I assumed that these grants were going to be rolling down like a mighty stream. Mm. I thought that it was going to happen, that every grant that I applied for, there was going to be funding. And uh, that cost me my personal situation, my financial situation. Um, you know, I was always broke and... That goes back to the other lessons is to, you know, um, learn from others, mm -hmm. talk to others. Um, so I tell people, be careful what you ask for, because that might just come around. But that goes to other things too, and not necessarily nonprofit, but because I'm, a, I'm in the nonprofit business, I usually focus on that. And uh, it was a difficult journey. I think I shared why it was a difficult journey a lot, a lot earlier, but I can't stress enough is that you know, you got to be careful what you ask for. And like I said, in my case, I wanted to start a nonprofit without really having that educational background of what a nonprofit was. But, you know, learn, learn from my mistake. One day I hope to write a book and uh, it's going to be all my failures and the obstacles that I overcome. And it's going to be a teaching tool. I do talk to a lot of people and I do tell them when you're going to start a nonprofit, learn from my faults. And I share tons of faults. All the mistakes that I made. Well, you're, you're very humble and I, I appreciate that. Of course I do. At the same time, you have been very successful. Yeah. And, and right. And uh, so I, I hear the obstacles that you had to deal with throughout your life, the lessons that you have learned and shared with our audience. And at the same time, I think it's fair to say you should be very proud of what you have done and the community should be very thankful for the work that you have done consistently your whole life and dealing with the obstacles at the same time, it, it, it just makes it more, more relevant. I do want to ask you another question though, before we close the program, are there any lessons, or maybe I should say, is there a lesson in life, in your career that you have unlearned that you decided that is not good. I got to do it differently. As I got older and more mature, I would say if I can talk to a younger Alberto at age 29, I would share my experience at late 50s. <laughs> I would say, not be so concerned of where I will be in the, in the future, but rather where I am today. I gave 40 years of my life to the community and I have served the community well. I walk hundreds of miles alongside the community in protest of injustices everywhere. I provided quality services to the community. I spent close to $100,000 of earnings to keep the organization afloat in the beginning. And I even survived prostate cancer. However, I never complained because I, was a, I always believed I was an instrument of the Lord. As I have grown older, I now want to think of me and the now and be happy for whatever years I have left. I am sure that the community will understand the community will always be in my heart as I am, as I am the community. I am nothing without the community, but I think that's what I would share with the younger Alberto is not be so consumed about the future. Take care of yourself. Now you overcame prostate cancer. You overcame a lot of difficulties and you've been a big success. Never forget that everywhere you've gone, you succeeded. And that's what I would tell a younger Roberto. I like it. I like it a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. Muchas, muchas gracias. And thank you for sharing your wisdoms with our global audience. 
I want to make a few closing comments. You have been listening to the international program 10 Lessons Learned. This episode is produced by Robert Hossery. And as always, we are supported by the Professional Development Forum. Our guest today is Alberto Esparza, a very successful servant leader providing educational opportunities for young people in underserved communities, sharing his 10 lessons learned. And to our audience, don't forget to leave us a review or a comment. You can also email us at podcast at 10 lessons learned. That is podcast at number 10, one zero lessons learned.com. I hope you will subscribe so that you don't miss any future episodes. And remember, this is a podcast that makes the world wiser and wiser, lesson by lesson. Muchas gracias y hasta la vista. Thank you and stay safe.